I will start uh, with the cases that were sent to you. I know that the cases and the emails were sent to you last night. So the most probable, uh, most of you didn't manage to contour uh, those cases. Uh, I have a plan B and that's what we're going to do today. Um, so at the end, I will come uh, to you and I will be available for you to contour uh, prostate cancers, ultrasound based um, together together. A question that I have is how many of you actually treat prostate cancer patients on a weekly basis? Um, if you have some numbers, that would be a great thing. If you don't, that's also okay. Um, uh, do you have an idea of how many? No. Okay, you don't treat. Uh, you treat. How many? One patient per week. Okay. Just to give you an idea of what we are doing in, uh, in our center is actually we have five to six uh, per prostate brachytherapy implants per week. Uh, so we're seeing, um, I would say the majority of patients, of male patients that we see is prostate cancer patients. Not all of them are suitable for brachytherapy, but brachytherapy is one of the uh, modalities that we're using to treat these patients. The second question would have been uh, how many brachytherapy is being utilized in your department? And since you're using uh, or you're seeing one patient, I believe that brachytherapy numbers are low. Um, that's the trend globally. We see that slowly brachytherapy is actually losing ground. Uh, we have the evolution of um, SABRs, uh, stereotactic ablative body radiotherapy which is easier for radiation oncologists in general to apply. It's, um, it's everywhere. You have to have a LINAC and that's everything uh, you need to do. So the plan for today was actually to review the clinical cases that you have contoured. I believe you didn't because the um, emails were sent late last night. Then review the volumes and have some discussion. And at the end, another contouring session with the um, information that you gain from the whole talk. Uh, I will restructure the whole thing just to um, give you an idea of what brachytherapy is and how we do it. So the clinical case was supposed to be a 72 year old patient. He was presenting in our department in May, 2022 with a PSA of 9.7. That's usually how it comes. He had a multi-parametric MRI in May. His prostate volume was 62 cc's, considered twice as large as a normal prostate. And he had a bilobar uh, lesions. So he had a left side peripheral zone lesion and a right side peripheral lesion, but with different uh, positions. One was in the apical part and the other one was in the basal part. He was uh, stratified as C2C, having lesions in both lobes. And he followed with a transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy, uh, which gave us a Gleason 7B, grade group three. Nine of the 12 cores were positive, up to 70% of the uh, in core involvement. Um, he later on had a conventional imaging, um, uh, as we consider it, a CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis, followed by a bone scan, both were negative for distant metastasis. And since we were planning this patient to enter a study that we're recruiting currently, he had a PSMA PET CT scan, which was also negative for um, lymphatic spread and distant metastasis osseous uh, lesions. This is the MRI of the patient. As you see, we have a quite uh, enlarged prostate in the sagittal view in the coronal view and in the uh, axial view. This patient didn't have any lower urinary tract symptomatology. Actually, the whole thing was, uh, was low. So he, he didn't have any uh, symptoms before um, doing a PSA test and having a high PSA. Um, uh, he did have a CT abdomen and pelvis, as I said. This is the, these are the images, the coronal and the axial views from the PSA scan. As you see, it's a bilobar extension. We see um, PSMA avid lesions 
in both um, lobes. The CT scan is actually uh, was done for planning CT purposes, um, showed us a prostate which was quite enlarged, but nothing, um, no calcifications or any other problems that uh, could cause a problem. Um, to summarize the whole thing, as we said, we had a 72 year old patient. He was stratified based on the NCCN guidelines, which we are using in Cyprus as an, an unfavorable intermediate localized prostate cancer. And um, after discussing therapeutic options, which would have been um, surgery, usually robotic assisted or radiotherapy, he chose to go with combined external beam radiation therapy plus HDR brachytherapy and long course ADT for 18 months. Um, ADT started in May 2022, and we see that that PSA dropped relatively uh, quickly. Uh, this is the protocol that we're using. The study that the patient was included is called HypoCombi. So we're using a hypofractionated a uh, protocol with 12 sessions of three gray on a daily fraction. It takes two and a half weeks. Then we have a pause of around a week to 10 days and we have an, an inpatient HDR implant, which is considered 14 gray in the periphery. Pre-requirements is that the patient is fit for anesthesia. We're usually using uh, spinal anesthesia. That an MRI can be done uh, we need a T2 for fusion purposes. And as I said, this patient had a um, PSMA PET CD done. This is a phase two study. It's actually recruiting quite well. We're close to uh, finishing the whole thing. And um, what we were trying to show is that toxicity using a high pop fractionated protocol is actually the same. So that was the way to get the cases that were actually uh, uploaded on the edge case. And uh, we're gonna uh, see that later on because you didn't have the chance probably to see them and contour them. So we had the same case, uh, the MRI images of that patient and an ultrasound which was uh, taken from the brachytherapy uh, just before implantation. So it's the pre-plan transrectal ultrasound image. The contouring should have included uh, as target volume is the prostate, the prostate capsule, and organs at risk were rectum, urinary bladder, and urethra. The urinary bladder is a question mark for most departments because usually it's a, it's a dynamic organ, and whether you contour it or not, it doesn't play a huge role. There is a notion in the literature, and more and more uh, institutions are researching the impact that the bladder neck is having on the whole thing but it's something that still is under research and we don't really, really know. So I'll start with an introduction and we'll, I will take you through what brachytherapy is actually uh, used for and how the whole thing started. So it's epidemiology evolution, going to pelvic anatomy and the different indications that we currently have, going to target volume definition, which is the essence of today's workshop and uh, how we can use those for our practical um, daily life. Epidemiology, I believe more of you already know that uh, we have prostate being one of the most prevalent cancer types. In males, I will say, I will bring to you some data from Cyprus. We have prostate cancer being the first uh, type of male cancer being diagnosed with lung cancer being the second. Whereas in Europe is the other way around. We have lung cancer being the, the most dominant. Um, it's something that I believe comes uh, from the early detection and that each individual male is actually doing a PSA test from early on, from 45 on. Um, as far as radiotherapy departments in general, we get our bread or daily bread and bacon at home from prostate cancer patients. The, the other part will be breast cancer and female patients, but uh, I would say that at least 30 to 40% of all radiotherapy departments are dealing with prostate cancer. Um, EBRT and brachytherapy are considered cornerstones, are essential in case we choose them. Uh, regarding treatment, we're talking about definitive treatment. So the aim is cure 
and the indications of HDR and LDR brachytherapy are gradually expanding. Uh, after the stampede data, we had also um, large meta-analysis by Kishon, which actually showed that the combination of modalities is improving data and improving the clinical outcome. So brachytherapy might not be uh, might not come to the, the end of its life, but um, the whole thing started somewhere like that. I usually like to speak about and compare radiotherapy with surgery. We have been treating patients uh, with surgery the last 3,000 years. Radiotherapy has a smaller lifespan. The first thing started in 1896 with Henri Becquerel, uh, the um, invention and discovery of, uh, not invention, discovery of radioactivity, where he got his uh, Nobel Prize in 1903. Then we had the Père Curie, which had the first uh, um, discovery of uh, radium and later on polonium. And I like to mention Alexander Graham Bell, which is known for a different um, uh, invention, but following the atmosphere of that era, he wrote a letter to the, art, uh, to the magazine uh, Science, stating that he could not imagine that a piece or a fragment of that radium could not be placed in a glass tube and inserted directly into the heart of cancer, as he mentioned. And that was the initial idea. I believe that's what followed later on. We had the first clinical applications in Paris due to the invention also of the first radioactive material in France. And these two, I would currently say radiation oncologists, they didn't know that, but were the first that applied uh, in patients and saw amazing results. That was with an open perennial approach. Somehow, radioactive materials and mainly radon and radium travel to the States. Hugh Hapton Young is considered the father of American urology. He was also an artist. He painted what he did to patients. I mean, the applications and where his radium capsules were placed. Um, and uh, he was the a pioneer in, in the whole approach. I'm, I'm putting there the Benjamin Barringer Award, which is actually the medal award given to uh, exceptional urologists in the States. The only reason that I'm putting that is if you closely look on, on the medal, you will see that uh, alpha, beta, and gamma radiation, and also urethral um, catheters are essential in the whole urology practice from the early ages. Then we have the dawn of brachytherapy, and we have some data that uh, at least by 1930, 80,000 patients in the States were treated for prostate cancer using radium therapy. That's how it was called at that time. Then we have a fall of brachytherapy until the 50s and 60s. And due to this guy, Professor Henschke, which was the inventor of the remote afterloader, which revolutionized the whole thing, you have to imagine that before that, the implantation of radium and radon was done per hand. So the exposure of radioactivity that the physicians were having was enormous. We know that even now the uh, Madame Curie uh, documents are still radioactive. So you have to imagine uh, how these things revolutionized the whole thing. Then we have the triplet of Whitmond, Hilaris, and Henschke, which started the uh, retropubic approach. I'm going to show it in a while. And a resurrection for brachytherapy came by Professor Holm and the inventor of uh, transrectal ultrasound, something that revolutionized the whole thing. So we started from that. These are drawings from Hap Hupton Young that I showed you before, the father of American urology. You see that we're using a glass tube transurethral application of radium was done. These are the dates that each radium capsule was placed and when. Then we have the retropubic approach that was uh, the uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering approach for many years. So the doctor was placing actually the radium capsules retropubically. And we came to the transurethral based transperineal implantation that is considered even today standard. 
So why is brachytherapy so important and why we're still discussing about it? We have the radiation source being directly inside the target. So it's the essence of internal, internal radiotherapy. What we're gaining from that is that we have a, a better coverage of the volume, having less exposure of organs at risk. At the same time, we have a dose escalation for high risk prostate cancers, and that's the essence basically, because with low risk cancer patients, we're even now discussing active surveillance, as you know. Uh, there is no need even to do anything about that. So we're dealing with unfavorable intermediate and high risk patients usually. And we have an improved oncological outcome, both, both as far as biochemical uh, recurrence is concerned and metastasis free survival. There is a dose superiority compared to only EBRT, and that's uh, something that we know. We have also uh, randomized uh, studies and retrospective analysis and peak meta-analysis. And here we see that uh, having urethra as our essence, we have a deep dose fall-off for the organs at risk. We're minimizing uh, the fractions to two or more. There were also some efforts for a single shot uh, that most of them uh, were not that su successful as far as biochemical recurrence is concerned. And we have well-documented oncological outcomes, a good toxicity profile. So brachytherapy is well tolerable and an extended follow-up regarding those patients. So they do well and they remain to do well. And we have also, sorry for that, the uh, possibility for re-irradiation, which is sometimes the trivial and difficult part in radiation oncology. When you already irradiated the prostate cancer with 74, 78 gray, and you have a recurrent intraprostatic, what do you do with that patient? SBRT is an option slowly, but brachytherapy, I believe, is uh, currently uh, a better option in comparison. What are the two options that we have? Actually, there are three, but uh, the one is sort of dying out. We have low dose rate and high dose rate. There is also pulse dose rate. I don't know if you heard anything about that, but it's rarely used maybe only in Europe is in Erlangen and even uh, Professor Sternat is turning towards HDR at the moment. Um, indications, we have the patient which is naive to treatment so we have we can use it as monotherapy use it solely as brachytherapy or we can add it to ebrt as a boost and that's one of the options that is rarely gaining ground and of course as i said before in re-radiation purposes purposes sorry <clears throat> especially in the post radiation setting um, coming now to pelvic anatomy we all know that <clears throat> prostate is situated uh, below the urinary bladder. Um, it's being um, as the rectum at the back. These are the two neighboring organs that are currently of interest. And we have some important structures found around prostate, which are dealing mostly with uh, continence and uh, retention and erectile function. And I like to usually say that erectile function is a population problem. And what I mean by that, I used to train and work in Germany and the people there were mostly interested in them getting cured of cancer and erectile function was coming as a second part. Now in Cyprus, people are tending to needing an erection until they die and they don't care if they die. So <laughs> you have a, a change in, in uh, in mindset, depending on where you are at the world. And, and, and globally, that's a trend that we usually see. Um, we have the zonal anatomy of prostate having uh, it being described by Professor McNeil. We have four different zones. It starts with the peripheral zone, which is usually the reason why still urologists are performing a digital rectal examination is, is directly attached to rectum. Usually 70% or two thirds of uh, prostate cancers will be diagnosed in this uh, zone. We have the central zone um, hosting 
less than 5% of carcinomas, and the transitional zone being um, the rest of the um, cases. The transitional zone is also the, the zone responsible for usually symptomatology regarding benign prostatic hyperplasia. So we have a zone uh, and the different zones are actually giving us or not symptoms as far as prostate cancer is concerned. We have the pirates and here we see how the radiologists are dividing the prostate based on those zones and what do we need them to give us by the end of the day. Pirates is actually an assessment mechanism that allows us to get from uh, the MRI usually images the probability of what we're seeing being cancerous. So the suspicion uh, of what we're seeing being uh, malignant will be decided by this exam. And from image to reality, here we see an MRI in the same division. So we have the anterior fibromuscular stroma being at the top, the peripheral zone being around. Here we have the so-called pseudo capsule and the transitional zone. If we go towards the bladder, we, we will see the central zone being also depicted in that uh, area. These are important because will be crucial also when we are contouring uh, prostate cancer. And especially now, which some of the researchers are focusing on focal or focus uh, brachytherapy and adding those by dose painting in lesions based both in MRI scans and PET CT scans, this is gaining importance. So the central zone is the area which is pretty much so shown by the arrows, not the yellow one. The yellow one is actually showing the pseudo capsule. So it's a, it's a small division within the prostate and it's something that we need to um, address. And then you have the peripheral zone around it, which is actually seen as uh, here uh, described. We have the anterior fibromuscular stroma, which it's usually the rarest place you can get cancer. Uh, we have to imagine that prostate has a capsule around it, which is also a pretty uh, thick anatomic barrier. And if you, I rarely see extension anteriorly. Usually you have the extension posteriorly and towards the seminal vesicles. And that is something that we will discuss later on. And then we have the Santorini plexus, which is actually uh, a reason or is, it can lead to our theory why we usually have vertebral metastasis uh, and it's hematogenous spread from prostate uh, towards the venous plexus of the sacrum. So target volume definition in brachytherapy. It doesn't, it's not different than uh, external beam. I mean, you have a prostate is anatomically defined and you need to contour it. So you have a GTV if you're dealing with macroscopic tumor. You have a CTV. In our case, it's usually uh, the prostatic capsule. So you need to, entire, to uh, encircle the whole uh, prostate. And we need to discuss about PTV, yes or no, depending on case. Um, I'm bringing you directly to the Jack Estro Acro prostate brachytherapy guidelines, which were recently uh, uh, published. Um, here it is clearly defined that CTV and PTV for prostate brachytherapy is defined as the prostate capsule and any extra prostatic extension. We were having discussions over discussions regarding the margins. There were more tendencies towards not having margins if we don't have high risk patients but the whole notion is still unclear. We have also the people uh, dealing with prostate cancer from the States, the American Brachytherapy Society, which in their last publication, I believe it was in 2012, they're stating that if you have a high risk patient, you need to include a three millimeter margin around the prostate, um, constraining that to the rectum posteriorly and the urinary bladder cranially. And that's what we more or less um, allowed or wrote down in these guidelines. These guidelines, as I said, are coming 
uh, from the Eurojet group, which is actually the part of the Jegastro being uh, responsible for prostate brachytherapy. And they were endorsed by the European uh, Association of Urology. OARs are considered the anterior rectal wall. That is taking into account that you're using usually transrectal ultrasound based brachytherapy. I would do the same with an MRI uh, based or a CT based brachytherapy. And at the same time is prostatic urethra. As you see here, there was no mention about urinary bladder that I mentioned before. So what are the challenges? We have an imaging evolution. We started with x-rays, uh, rarely seeing even the, the, the prostate. We we're focusing on uh, bone anatomy. We slowly went to a CT scan, which was more or less the same thing, uh, but instead of having one uh, slice, we had multiple slices. And uh, slowly we got an idea about soft tissue information. We were not precise, but we were trying. Going on to the MRI, we had an improvement of soft tissue contrast. And the future is actually the present where we have modalities like the PSMA, PET CT, or choline before, which are giving us also a biological essence of what we're dealing with and seeing focally the so-called dominant lesions, the DIL. Why is target definition important? It's important because we need to take two things into account. We shouldn't underestimate what we're seeing and we shouldn't overestimate what we're seeing. What I mean by that, we shouldn't underestimate. We should give the dose where it's needed and we shouldn't compromise disease control. So we need the dose exactly where it's needed, but at the same time, we shouldn't overestimate and cover normal tissues with extra dose because that's gonna reflect and be translated into acute and long-term effects. So the crucial part about defining something is to see the best way possible and try and contour what you are seeing in the best way to minimize toxicities and to maximize uh, coverage. So it is clear that target delineation is not focused on, on, on radiotherapy technique. Whether you're using external beam or brachytherapy, the same thing needs to be done. So we're looking into basically three things that actually stratify localized prostate cancer, and that is T stage, and it's something that we need to see if there's extension beyond the prostate. Do we have a 3A or 3B disease? We need to know the Gleason score or grade group um, score and the number of positive biopsies. Because if we have a patient with uh, 20 biopsies and only one is positive, then we're dealing with a different type of disease than if we have 10 out of 10 being positive. The PSA is still and remains a crucial part of the whole process that we need to, to know. The types of procedures that are currently in place are actually three. You can either do a transrectal ultrasound based, uh, usually it's done with a transperineal implantation, what we do in our department to avoid any changes and mistreatment, we're fusing the ultrasound images with an MRI, uh, which is done on the same day. Then you have the so-called two-step approaches, the CT-based and the MRI-based, and is what you see on the right side of the screen. In both CT and MRI-based techniques, usually you are implanting in under transrectal ultrasound guidance. So you don't wanna spend a lot of time on the CT or on MRI. If you have the availability, that's the best thing. But usually everything is done on an ultrasound and then there's a transfer of the patient um, to uh, the MRI or the CT for the planning at the end. So the different imaging modalities, I'll start with a CT. 
uh, which is considered standard for target delineation mainly in the EBRT world. All or most of the treatment planning systems are using and calculating the absorbed dose based on density and Hounsfield units. And we need to stick to a point that CT overestimates prostate volume by at least 20 to 60%. And that's something that has been known. Um, we have a lack of distinction of prostate for clinical adjacent structures, a wide variation on atomic positions, because usually what we clearly see are bony structures and we're focusing on those instead of the soft tissue structures, which is prostate and, and the seminal vesicles. And there is usually a variation of shape, which is underestimated in regard to BPH to B9 prostatic hyperplasia. There were a lot of studies and we know that there is intra and inter-observer variability. What does that mean? That even the same radiation oncology on different days or times will contour the prostate based on CT in a different way. And the same thing applies to colleagues within each other. And that is giving us that 20 to 70, 20 to 60 percent uh, variability as far as CT is concerned. So CT, it's a good thing if you don't have an alternative. Where do you have the problems with CT? Uh, we have the problems basically in defining the anterior uh, part of the prostate and the cranial part of the prostate. And at the same time, the uh, distance between the penile bulb and the apex. And these were known. And the guidelines regarding uh, CT and its application. Um, we're focusing not on anatomy because they couldn't see what's going on. They were focusing mainly on risk group. So if you had a low risk prostate cancer patient, you were contouring more or less the prostate without adding any additional um, margins. If you had a high risk prostate cancer, you were adding at least 2.2 centimeters cranially to cover the seminal vesicles. So it was an approach that wasn't fully uh, seeing anatomy, but it was more or less trying to cover for mistakes and not allow um, loss of coverage in essential areas. And the same thing you're seeing here is actually on the uh, right side, you have an MRI scan and on the left, the other way around, on the left, you have an MRI scan and on the right, you have a CT scan. And as you see, the, the, the approach is turning difficult since you don't actually see anything. You're trying to more or less imagine a prostate capsule and just try and, and cover the whole thing there. That's the base. On the left-hand side, you clearly see an MRI scan where the base is clearly defined. On the right-hand side, if you don't have the, the MRI to more or less imagine how it is on a CT scan, you have a difficulty. Then we we're entering the transrectal ultrasound-based um, uh, approach and the challenges that we're facing there. It's considered standard at the moment and the delineation and also implantation of catheters is usually done under transrectal ultrasound guidance. What I need to say here is that the image quality is greatly affected by artifacts. If you've done a an ultrasound guided brachytherapy, you know that. If you have calcifications, you usually don't see the part of the prostate where the calcifications are situated. If you have uh, metal artifacts for any reason, you have a problem. The same thing occurs with anatomic alterations. If you have a TURP or a holep being uh, taking a piece of the prostate out, then you're uh, having difficulty in estimating the prostate volume at this level. And is for sure the, the image modality with the greatest user dependence. Is usually it's a radiation oncologist or a urologist somewhere in an office, in a bunker, trying to set up together with a medical physicist the, uh, the settings of the ultrasound. So the image quality that you are getting, depending also, also on the machine that you're using, are giving you the image quality that you deserve. And that's usually uh, not the same for all of us. So the challenges here, again, in comparison with the MRI. On the top, we see 
uh, especially here where it's clearly seen and ultrasound image and on the bottom you see an MRI mid gland and you see that the differences are, are clearly seen. In case you have an MRI, you need to utilize it in any way possible. And that's what I tried to do for you because I needed that we wouldn't have the time to, uh, you wouldn't have the time to uh, contour. So that's the apex of uh, prostate and I tried to contour the whole thing. That's the mid uh, apical part. And you see what I tried to do, a mid base and then the base of the prostate. What you are seeing in the middle is actually two anchor needles that were uh, placed for um, stability purposes. So what is important for transrectal ultrasound uh, contouring? First of all, is the definition of rectum. Uh, on the right-hand side, you see how uh, the surgeons are going about that area. And on the left-hand side, I contoured three different structures, basically two and one is between the, the whole thing, um, trying to show you what's going on. In ultrasound, the rectal mucosa or the anterior rectal wall is situated somewhere around there. What we're using when we're implanting is usually the so-called de Novilliers fascia. It's retroprostatic fascia. It's, um, division between the prostate and rectum, giving us some space that we could work. And why we're contouring that as rectum, we're in close proximity to prostate and we're increasing the distance from the rectal mucosa. So if we're okay with the dose prescribed in that part of the rectum, the rectal mucosa is at least three uh, millimeters away and the dose to the rectal mucosa is even less. So that is one of the explanations why, why the gastrointestinal toxicity in regard to brachytherapy is so, so low, because the approach is uh, uh, with caution regarding rectum. Regarding urethra, what we usually do, we're placing a urethral catheter. You rarely see the urethra if you don't have a catheter in an ultrasound um, uh, guided brachytherapy. So as you see on the right hand side, urethral is, the urethral catheter is being depicted. What we do in our department and in many departments around Europe is actually uh, not in the first place in the pre-plant, but in the life plan. Once we have the needles in and they can be either metal or plastic catheters, we're using endogel, so the same gel that's used for endoscopic purposes, and we're creating foam. This foam, the bubbles of the foam, can be clearly visible while you're taking the acquisition of images. And you can more or clearly see the urethral catheter, which is being placed there, and you can um, expand that to cover the urethra. Um, that's a small video that I don't think. Yeah. It's not working. Yeah, it was a contouring just to have an idea of what's going on from the apex uh, to the top. I can show it to you later when we're uh, dealing with that. It's not. Okay. We, we can see later, it's okay. And what about guidelines and publications regarding transrectal ultrasound guided? The, the publications come from the American Brachytherapy Society and it's way back to 2012. They're planning to um, update them, but at the moment we don't have uh, any changes. So we have a target definition based on transrectal ultrasound. It's focused more on anatomy in comparison to CT, which was entirely based on bony structures and expansions, but is greatly affected by artifacts, as we said. Exactly the same thing applies here that the CTV and any expansion of the CTV, we're dealing and we're focusing on uh, the disease and related issues. Coming to the MRI, which is actually the, ho the holy grail of uh, imaging at the moment, 
um, Carl Salibier and, and the uh, team of Eurojack actually together with ACROP had a consensus guideline regarding CT and MRI based target volume delineation. And these are the um, advantages basically of the MRI being listed here. So MRI give us, gives us an anatomic, anatomically correct prostate volume. What we see is what we get. We have a superior soft tissue imaging with excellent special resolution. The identifications of OARs is superior to CT. You can see your, the urethra. You can see the penile bulb without a problem. You need, don't need to imagine things. And in case that there is a dominant lesion, the DIL, we can also try and do the focus or focal uh, approaches, either using SBRT in case of external beam or using uh, brachytherapy and placing catheters inside or close in close proximity to the dominant lesions. We have a, a multiplanar capability. You get the, the set of sequences that you see on the right-hand side. You can get a T2, which is the best uh, regarding the lineation. You get a diffusion weighted image where you can see if the lesion that you saw in the T2 is uh, malignant together with the ADC. Uh, you have the best um, visualization. And what MRI does in comparison to a CT, you have a better inter-observer variability or a less inter-observer variability. So all of us see more or less the same thing. We don't have that 20 to 60% uh, we discussed previously. Um, some practical implications regarding the planning MRI. Uh, it should be done as close as possible to treatment. What we do in our department, we're doing trans ultra, transrectal ultrasound based implantation and transperineal uh, implantation. And we're doing an MRI just before starting the transrectal ultrasound guidance uh, approach. Um, there should be a same preparation protocol. So what you're trying to do is to have the same bladder volume and the same bowel. Uh, and rectum volume at the at the same time. And the sequences that are appropriate are usually the T2 plus whether you need a diffusion weighted images or something different. An image fusion um, needs to be done in case, as I said, if you are planning or uh, contouring in a different modality. This is an overview of what's uh, the publication is about. So it states everything that has to do with prostate, beginning with rectum. There is an MRI um, defined um, condition and a CT scan based. So you can see all the different changes. And again, the thing that I was mentioning before, the CT is actually focusing on stratification rather than anatomy. It's not what you see, what you get, it's what the parameters and, and, and the notion that you are getting from the different parameters. Uh, PSA, which is irrelevant for anatomy and imaging, is Gleason score, which again is irrelevant for anatomy. But since we don't see, we're trying to uh, sort of get our way through the whole thing. The apex in an MRI should be a butterfly-shaped structure, as you see there, in, uh, in comparison to a CT scan, which is sh should start approximately one centimeter above the upper border of the penile bulb. So you have these discrepancies. Then moving on to the mid-prostate, the lateral border should be bounded by the uh, levator terrain, and the anterior border should exclude the retropubic space. The posterior border is the anterior border of rectum. On the other hand side, we have these discrepancies again. We don't know what exactly uh, should be done. And we're contouring as we're doing for the rest of uh, our EBRT sessions. The mid prostate in the MRI scan, here you, have, you sort of see the Eiffel Tower. The same thing should be seen here uh, regarding. Uh, the uh, different regions um, 
and the base should be in continuity with the bladder and should be always, and that's something that we need to do always, we need to utilize all of our views. That means we're contouring on an axial view, but it's a good thing if we're turning that to a sagittal to get the extent and to a coronal view to get the full images. So we're treating 3D. Um, yeah. The same thing applies as far as seminal vesicle and extra prostatic extension. The risk of invasion in uh, regard to MRI should be uh, evaluated and accordingly you're expanding the volumes that you are seeing. Um, in the case of extra prostatic extension in brachytherapy, what we usually do is what I told you at the beginning, we're adding a margin of three millimeters in that specific location. So in the CT scan is CTV equals prostate capsule for low risk. And we have expansions depending on risks, as we said before. Um, regarding rectum, the same thing applies as we saw. And that's how you are contouring rectum on a CT scan. And we're moving once again to the brachytherapy options. Um, there are two types of procedures or two types of, uh, of to utilize these modalities. We have the single step procedure that I'm gonna explain and the two step procedure. The single step procedure is usually done or is what is actually done in most uh, brachytherapy departments. Everything is transrectal ultrasound based and transperineal implantation. We are doing a pre-plant so we have images of the prostate prior to implantation. We're doing an inverse planning. We're seeing where we would in optimally uh, need catheters. And once we know where we would like to have catheters placed, we're starting with the needle, the catheter implantation. One, once we're done, we're having another acquisition of ultrasound images. Uh, and now with the catheters in place, and we're recontouring or modifying our contour. If you have the possibility to have an MRI scan as we're trying to do in our department, you're fusing the images as we said before. Regarding two-step procedure, it starts with a transrectal ultrasound guided uh, transperineal implantation. So everything is done as it should have uh, be done for the single step approach, but then the patient is transferred to have an MRI scan or a CT scan where the planning and contouring will also take place. So you have a two, two, two different modalities being uh, playing a crucial role in these approaches. For the brachytherapy setup, uh, it's actually the template, the ultrasound uh, probe that you need and we're usually doing the whole thing in the so-called lithotomy position with the legs up. And low dose rate is actually, uh, these are the recommendations from uh, NCCN guidelines. They're either using iodine, palladium, or cesium, and it doesn't play a huge role as far as uh, oncological outcomes, but it's depending on availability and country, basically. Uh, the different types of seeds, you can have loose seeds or you have stranded seeds. The stranded have a better or they're easier to place um, uh, and you have an equal distance between them. Um, I don't really do low dose rate. Um, I can, in another session, we can discuss why, but it's an approach that has been done uh, it has a long history from 1980, as you saw, and it's something that can be performed. In Europe, it's mostly performed by urologists, except in Holland, in the Netherlands, where there are a lot of radiation therapy departments still utilizing this approach. High dose rate brachytherapy, uh, the same setting, more or less. So you have a, a template, you have an ultrasound probe, and you're trying to... Uh, transperineally use uh, this uh, approach. We're using 
usually hollow metal needles or plastic tubes depending on modality if you're using an mri you need to modify your approach uh, to uh, have this um, uh, the metals will not be utilized you have to, have to get titanium or plastic needles and as you see here you're you are either using 20 millimeters and 20 centimeters or 24 centimeters uh, needles and something that needs to be addressed is that the first usually seven or nine depending on company millimeters are considered that space so the radioactive source will manage to come at a certain point but not further than that that needs to be taken into account once you're implanting you need to be a bit higher than the intended space that's a video that's but thank God it's playing. And it's uh, uh, just a primal thing of what we're actually doing. So we're implanting catheters into a hollow organ. And what we're actually doing through a wire, a radioactive source is entering this tube, stopping at certain positions which are pre-calculated for a certain amount of time. The longer that this radioactive source is remaining at a certain place, the bigger the sphere of the radiation that you're having. And through that, you're covering the organ that you need. The approach, at least in our department, starts with the spinal anesthesia. It's the immobilization of the patient, the so-called lithotomy position, as women are giving birth. We're doing an acquisition of ultrasound images. The same day, this patient will have also an MRI scan uh, with the same conditions, with a urethral catheter. Why we're doing that? we're using the balloon in the urethral catheter to define the uh, urinary prostatic junction, uh, vesicoprostatic junction. And through that, we're able to fuse image at the same level. The contouring phase will start with the so-called pre-plant. So we don't have any uh, catheters applied this time. And once we are knowing where we would like optimally to have the catheters, then we're starting with the implantation. Um, following the, the implantation, we're taking again images, another acquisition of ultrasound images, now with the catheters in place. Contouring the so-called life plan, we're using once again the images of the, old, of the MRI that was done before. What we're using that is mainly to define the apex and the base. And once we're ready and we know that what we did is actually uh, what we would like to have, we're seeing the dosimetric analysis. And if we're satisfied, then we're treating the patient. The whole procedure that I'm currently stating in our department is usually done in two hours. We started initially because we transferred our team from Germany to Cyprus. Initially, they were, it was taking us around three to four hours, but it has a learning curve. The team gets more acquainted and slowly you're reaching uh, time durations which are really, really favorable. What we usually see is actually that. So have a coverage of the prostate without uh, causing problems to the rectal mucosa, especially if you are defining and delineating the de Novilliers fascia, as I mentioned before. Um, that's a 3D reconstruction, and you see all the dual positions and dual times found as bits on that straight line. And that's what we want to do. Um, why HDR monotherapy? So we have the potential to widen our therapeutic ratio. It has an improved dosimetry. Um, it's something that we want to uh, at least uh, state that it should be expressed to a better toxicity profile in regard to low dose rate, uh, even though we don't have studies that are compared the two, to be honest. Uh, reduced cost in comparison to LDR or EBRT. Um, if you're already performing gynae brachytherapy, it can be an addition without a big cost 
to the clinic or the department that you're doing that. And the treatment delivery is usually few fractions. We know that we have two implant approaches, two implant fractions that are well tolerated with supreme results. So you don't need to have the 39 sessions or even 20 sessions that are currently uh, are do used with external beam. Um, there are no radiation protection concerns. That in relations to low dose rate, where you have a radioactive uh, material placed in the prostate, which has a certain half life and is actually radiating locally, and you have uh, to be cautious, especially the small children and uh, any other uh, people in the family. So the workflow is what we already uh, discussed. You can have it transrectal ultrasound based, the whole procedure. So the needle insertion, the outlining and the planning, or you have the two-step MRI CT based approach where the needle insertion is done uh, using an ultrasound uh, guidance. Then the patient is being transferred to an MRI or a CT scanner for imaging purposes, outlining and planning at the end. The current trend uh, or the uh, based on the NCCN guidelines is either two implants uh, or uh, the two implants and four fractions. Um, I believe that two, three implants uh, has gained a lot of uh, attention in something that should be utilized. We don't mention the so-called so single shot because as I said at the beginning, the results and the clinical outcomes were not as we thought they would be. Uh, the reasons behind are still uh, investigated. Some mentioned that the radiobiology of prostate adenocarcinoma is one where you have a mixture of cells in different parts of the cell cycle. And once you're giving a, a single shot, you're just killing the ones that should have been killed at that certain uh, period. Um, some other have a notion that maybe the dose wasn't enough. They were done by one times 19 or one times 20. I have also review from uh, the Prada group uh, a, a paper with one, uh, one times 20.5. I don't believe that this dose is the one causing problems. I have the notion that probably has to do with the radiobiology and with oxygenation of cells. So the fractionation should be hypo or a ultra hypo fractionated, but it needs to be at least two implants. Uh, again, it was a time to uh, find the case and contour the whole thing, but I don't believe that we're, we will be able. I'll be sitting and I'll, I'll try and contour with you some of the cases to get an idea of what's going on. Um, so since we didn't have the chance to contour and explain everything as we should have based on your results, I'll try and give you some cases and some uh, try and find some uh, logic in how we are contouring prostate cancer in brachytherapy, who, which people and who are suitable for the whole thing, who are not, and uh, some practical cases from uh, our daily practice. So my suggestions, when, once you have a prostate cancer patient, regardless of modality that you're going to use, is always review the pathology. Uh, if you have the chance to discuss with the histopathologist, that's the best thing. We Not all of us have the chance. Um, depending on uh, situation, but it's a good thing if you know the biopsies, if you have questions regarding the biopsies, um, you should state them. A thing that I'm trying currently with our group in, in Cyprus is we're always sending the patients for an MRI scan before the biopsies. So if you have the availability of an MRI, you should utilize it, get the clearest view the urologist or the radiation oncologist or uh, the radiologist that's going to perform the uh, biopsy should have a clear view, visualize the lesions, know where he, he should hit and get the best result out of the prostate. It 
it has been for many years the transrectal approach wasn't the best approach there is a notion in the european association of urology <clears throat> which they are stating that transperineal approach is superior to transrectal approach as far as biopsy is concerned so if you have the chance at least to have an mri before having the biopsy done that's the best option review then the diagnostic mri where is the dominant lesion do i have a dominant lesion do i see uh, many smaller ones we already know from prostatectomies that there is not a single dominant lesion prostate cancer is a multifocal disease <clears throat> it means that you might see one but if you take the whole thing out you will find also smaller lesions in nearby areas and that needs to be taken into approach uh, into account and it's something that um, is currently the problem with focal approaches the addition of PSMA PET CT though can give us a better approach as far as and a bit better understanding of what we're dealing with. Um, we have been doing a lot of research on that. We have published uh, from my time in the University of Freiburg in Germany, um, PSMA, NMRI, fusion, GTV uh, was superior to PSMA or MRI uh, re uh, contoured lesion. So if the more information you have, the more precise you will be in your treatment. So review your planning CT. Try and see where the apex and bases. Use also the CT-based approaches as we, we showed today. They were contoured based on average anatomy you need to know that and you need to try and, and be as close to that as possible and review your planning mri in case you are having the availability to have one again apex and apex and base should be clearly seen and defined because that's where you're minimizing toxicities to nearby organs slice thickness is of importance it's it's worthless if you have uh, 10 millimeter slices you just see the prostate in certain position you need to have small uh, slices so that even the reconstruction of the prostate is uh, and the image is optimal you need to basically write down whatever you have in mind because that's going to allow you to properly treat the patient and not lose anything um, while contouring continually assess your volumes what does that mean uh, you have modalities we, we discuss ct mri ultrasound sometimes and psma pet ct see what you have on all modalities don't just use one modality like mri because it's superior as far as soft tissue uh, uh, delineation is con concerned and just leave the rest uh, at bay use utilize whatever you have and use all planes both axial sagittal and coronal from all three planes you can get valuable information that's the correct planning regardless of radiotherapeutic modality use common sense as the christmas tree next uh, showing you cannot have anatomy that changes drastically from one slide to the other you cannot have a prostate which is that big in the mid base and the next slide is that big or changing uh, in position so think 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 about the anatomy where you are at and what you are trying to do check prostate volume against previous Im imaging exams usually patients do mris or ct scans before that especially you might have patients that came after holep a holmium laser uh, a nucleation or uh, had a turp before and you need to see where and what has been done take that into account and allow time for contouring if you are in a hurry most of the cases will be contoured suboptimally i would say 
and when in doubt, usually discuss it with a colleague. What we have as a motto in my department is that four eyes are better than two eyes. So if you have the more, uh, you, if you have a team and you can uh, employ the whole team into the game, just do so. Um, know the strengths and limitations of different modalities. That is the take home message. Just utilize and know what, what each modality is offering you. You want bony structures, you need your CT. You need soft tissue, probably uh, you will be better off having an MRI scan. Ultrasound can be used as far as brachytherapy is concerned for implantation with no problem. Target volume definition depends on cancer features and not on radiotherapy technique. So uh, delineate what you would delineate regardless of modality. The guidelines are there to give us a path, but we need to do the, the walk on our own. So we know the guidelines, you can read the guidelines, you can see the overviews and the whole thing that's being uh, published, but you need to apply them. Uh, just reading how to contour, uh, it's a good thing, but you usually need to review them some months later to get a better understanding of what you're doing. And practice makes perfect. If you're starting your career uh, at the beginning, usually everything looks um, to be um, full and enough, and uh, you have many information that you cannot really put into uh, a proper way to understand it. So if you're practicing what you're lead, reading, uh, finding out and uh, visiting and revisiting the cases as you did, uh, I believe that's the best thing. These are some references uh, regarding um, uh, what we discussed today. And I would like to uh, close the first part of my talk with that. Um, I have some practical cases. I think that they are on the uh, same presentation, but they were hidden. Uh, so just give me a moment. I'll try and bring it back and we can discuss that also. There are some hidden slides. Sorry. There are some slides that were hidden. Can we hide them to show them? No. Can I use it? Basically, this one is until the end. Shall I do it? Yeah. So, um, it's actually it's the backup plan since uh, the uh, emails came last night and you didn't have the chance to contour the whole thing. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, so we have the practical cases. Is brachytherapy the best approach for all patients? Guaranteed, no. You need to properly select patients and you need to get the patients also involved in the whole procedure. Uh, they need to understand the pros and cons of each modality, and they need to understand what they're getting themselves into and what they're getting out of the whole procedure. So what we're usually doing and what we usually need is actually a proper patient selection. We need to know the gland size. As we saw before, the case that I, uh, I presented was a 62 cc uh, prostate, so it's considered uh, big. Uh, the previous Czech Estro guidelines were discussing that anything beyond 50 to 60 cc's shouldn't be treated by brachytherapy. The new guidelines has re have rephrased that and they don't mention a volume. They mention that if it can be implanted due to the pubic arch 
or due to any other changes that can be uh, it, it can be attempted. I need to know if there is a locally advanced prostate cancer case. Do I have a T3 or a T3B uh, or A case? And if I have that, is monotherapy, for example, a, a good option? I would say no. Uh, is a combination with EBRT a good option? I would say yes, because you need the intraprostatic dose, but at the same time, you need the margin that uh, is applied around it. Has the patient had an outflow obstruction? Is this outflow obstruction manageable? Is he able to have a TURP or a HOLEP? Should he do that before we start treatment of radiation therapy? These are th some of the approaches that need to be done. And prostatic calcification, that is something that is bothering radiation oncologists and especially brachytherapy uh, specialists for a long time. So size does matter when it comes to prostate brachytherapy. Uh, both in a positive and negative way. If you have a small prostate, I would say 15 to 20 cc's, uh, we need to ask ourselves, is there enough tissue where we can introduce catheters? Will this introduction and implantation cause us to have a hot urethra, have a, an increased dosage on the urethra and maybe call, cause uh, in a later on stage, some strictures or some uh, problems in that area. Would the proper coverage of the prostate be uh, aimed, that we're aiming, uh, covered or not? So these are questions that we need to answer in regard to small prostates. In, on the contrary, if you have a high and a big prostate, a, a larger volume, is there a highest chance for a urinary retention? I would say that the size doesn't matter. We have also published some data on that in the last estro, and we showed that even patients with up to 120, 125 cc prostates, four times the, the size, can be treated with brachytherapy, but you need to choose your battles. You cannot treat all the 120 cc prostates with the same approach. And pubic arch interference is a problem. What I usually see is when we have short uh, men with big prostates, due to the size, their pubic uh, inlet is usually smaller and you cannot fully utilize the whole uh, or view the whole of the prostate. And that's an interference where the pubic arch comes into play. That's the pubic arch more or less, and you need to see if the prostate that I have in front of me can be implanted as it should. So some contraindications, some of them are absolute and some of them are limit uh, relative. So first of all, in all radiotherapeutic techniques and in all modalities, we need to see if the patient that we have in front of us has a limited life expectancy. There is no point treating a patient that is 95 year old and has comorbidities, diabetes and um, um, cardiac uh, problems and so on and so forth. So choose which patients will benefit from what you're proposing and what you're treating. Um, there are some unacceptable operative risks. There are some people that cannot withstand anesthesia, which is a vital part of the whole process. So if the patient is unfit for anesthesia, you shouldn't treat him that way. Um, some other conditions like ataxia, telangiectasia, and the presence of this metastasis, that's something that is clear cut and we shouldn't get into that. So if there is a large transurethral resection of the prostate, meaning that there is just a bit of prostatic tissue left, there is no point doing brachytherapy because you don't have the tissue where you would have want to implant needles. So try and see holistically the patient. Some relative contraindications, inflammatory bowel disease. I need to disagree with that because one of the indications in our department at least 
for performing brachytherapy is either ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, because we want the, um, the rectum being exposed to, to those to be lower and the best or the optimal way to do that is brachytherapy. A history of private pelvic irradiation, that's also not true because brachytherapy is one of the modalities that can be easily used in case of re-radiation. So that is not the case. A large median lobe is something that should be discussed. And it's one of the anatomic variations that we need to address. And we need to clearly see that is uh, not problematic. Usually large median lobes are causing also lower urinary tract symptomatology. So we need to basically see and hear what our patients are telling us. If a patient cannot, cannot urinate at night or if a patient cannot fully empty his bladder, we cannot perform brachytherapy because the swelling coming from trauma that you are causing, imagine you have a prostate, which is sort of... Uh, the size of a chestnut or the size of a small uh, orange, and you need to implant 18, 20 needles. You will be causing an edema. You will be causing a swelling. So you need to take that into account. That patient, if he has a large median lobe, will be necessitating or he will be needing a urethral catheter until the swelling goes away. And that might be at least two weeks. You need to inform the patient that the risks are there. And if he wants to take the whole thing, uh, he can. Again, this prostate gland size, we discussed it just before. Uh, I believe this notion has been um, uh, uh, stopped. Uh, we don't focus on size. We focus more on, mostly on anatomy. A poor urinary function. Uh, we're using the International Prostate System score, the IPSS. If you have something above 20, you shouldn't choose uh, brachytherapy as an option for your patients. So some cases, some real uh, events. That's a prostate. Everything looks okay. Despite that, this patient had a urinary retention following implant. We need to take into account, which is a, a clear case that I wouldn't, tell this patient you are not a candidate for brachytherapy. Despite that, we know that there are a lot of factors and a lot of parameters that play a role as far as brachytherapy is concerned. One of them is spinal anesthesia. The patient must, might have problems urinating due to a fall, false, I wouldn't say, due to a suboptimal a spinal anesthesia. That can be the case. It can be due to drugs that we are prescribing, an iatrogenic uh, change. Uh, what we're usually doing, we're giving alpha blockers. Some of the alpha blockers are not helping the patient, they're like causing exactly the, uh, the contrary. Alpha blockers like tamzulosin, which has been, or alfuzosin that have been used for ages, and even newer generation drugs can cause a urinary retention. So, we have to listen and hear to what patients are saying. Um, this is a patient which had a, a thickening of his bladder wall. And the, even though the prostate was of a normal size, you could see that his lower urinary tract symptomatology wasn't optimal. We didn't allow this patient to have brachytherapy, even though the imaging conditions were perfect for brachytherapy. We didn't have a problem, but as you see, the bladder neck was quite thickened and implanting that part of the prostate, not prostate actually, that part of the bladder, which is necessary for performing the optimal brachytherapy would have been and meant that he would have increased his lower urinary tract symptomatology and minimize his quality of life. Um, the same is actually occurring with this patient. And this is an approach where, or a patient in a case where we see a large median lobe. I never implant such patients because I know that they will be having problems once we're done. Uh, it's, 
anatomically, it's something that uh, if the patient insists on having uh, a radiotherapy in general, I would send him to a urologist for a TURP to have a transurethral resection of that part of the prostate. And then on a later stage, three months, six months later, we can perform uh, brachytherapy or another modality of radiation therapy. And that's something that we need to discuss with patients. Um, this is a case with extreme calcification. If you're using the ultrasound approach with such patients, you will not be able to see the anterior border and you will be having an underestimation of the prostate volume. So that's another case where brachytherapy will not be the best option. And it's something that you need to take into account and you need to evaluate the images before offering something. That's coming back to seeing and hearing what the patients and what the imaging that the patient has done will provide to you. You cannot do it in any other way. If you just rush everything, you will get on the... Uh, on the OR, you will have the patient having a spinal anesthesia and you will not be able to visualize anything and you will start implanting here and there without seeing and without being able to reconstruct properly your catheters. So you have a, a suboptimal condition and probably you will cause more harm than the good. Again, the, the cases and what we were supposed to control. Basically, that's it. Uh, I will be, um, uh, I brought my laptop with me so I can uh, show you some cases and if you have an interest, we can contour them together. Yeah. Do you have any questions or anything wasn't clear? And as I said, I come from uh, Cyprus. Uh, our center is situated in Limassol in, in Cyprus. We're performing, as I said, five to seven prostate brachytherapy implants per week. We're considered an Electa Brachy Academy reference center. So I think the, the distance from Egypt and Cairo to uh, Cyprus uh, by plane is one hour and 15 minutes. So everyone that is wanting to experience and get into brachytherapy or learn more is welcomed and we will be glad to have you. Yeah. Thank you. I am Dr. Ihab Mustafa. I am the ex-head of the Department of Radiation of Clinical Oncology and Shams University. Uh, first of all, I, uh, I would like to uh, uh, thank you for attending uh, the meeting our uh, ninth uh, meeting, University of Shams University uh, Cave College Conference. Uh, this is a brachytherapy uh, in uh, uh, brachytherapy workshop. Uh, I would like to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Yusuf Strassos. He is a radiation oncologist in German Oncology Center in Cyprus, uh, and he is a member of uh, Eurojec, which is an estro group. Uh, we, uh, dealing with uh, urogenital cancer. Uh, Dr. Yusuf, starting uh, with uh, the introduction, and uh, he will go through um, the following. Uh, first, he, uh, I think he sent uh, to you the clinical cases uh, uh, for all people who registered uh, for the break therapy. Then he will review the contours in your computers. Uh, then um, uh, give his ideas and his uh, advices like regarding this uh, uh, contours. And uh, then at the end, he will uh, doing uh, the idea contour from his uh, point of view, and uh, everyone will compare it with what he did. 
so uh, uh, first, Dr. Yusuf gives the introduction, and now he will go through the people in the workshop to review with them, everyone with his contour. Thank you, Dr. Yusuf. Welcome. Uh, hi. So we managed to get the, let's say, uh, author structures once again. Um, we didn't have the chance to uh, see the contoured uh, structures that you did. I will try and show you what the cases were about and how they were contoured. Um, we usually have an approach to start from either the base or the <clears throat> apex. This is the MRI case. Um, the structures that were supposed to be contoured were the prostate, urethra, rectum, and bladder. And I'll start from the top. I hope you all are able to see. And going down. So we see basically the balloon of the transurethral catheter that was placed. And you see that the contour of the bladder were focusing on the exterior wall of the bladder. Uh, coming down, we will slowly see the basal part of the prostate, so still bladder. You see that rectum is actually beginning to, to be seen. Uh, there was a question if we're uh, contouring on the, the anterior rectal wall in the MRI case. Since you see the whole of the rectum, I would contour the rectum on, in total. Um, just for a, a sort to say clarification purposes, um, we have an internal agreement in the Eurojec that states that from the basal part of the prostate, we're contouring five millimeters above that. Yeah, as far as rectum is concerned, you don't need to contour any, any further than that. The reason is that we don't care about the dose above that because you wouldn't have a dose pillage pill, 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 uh, above that uh, part. <clears throat> Coming down to the, um, again, here we can also depict the seminal vesicles which are easily defined and you see that the prostate was defined around the balloon on the right side that was the base coming down slowly encompassing the whole of the prostate and this way you continue the seminal vesicles are at the bottom as a crucial part not to include them you can if you want, but you want, uh, you're not treating the prostate, you're treating the prostate plus a part of the seminal vesicles. And if you go down, still contouring the prostate capsule, you see that some structures, which are usually on the sides and the posterior lateral part of the prostate, called neurovascular bundles, will slowly uh, be seen. Still, is here the bladder, uh, the seminal vesicles to be seen. In the ultrasound case, we'll see something that is allowing us to define the base of the prostate. And we're taking actually into account where the seminal vesicles are meeting, they are creating sort of a trigone and that a triangle. And that's the area where we're setting our base. Continuing with the uh, prostate, you see now that the peripheral zone has been included in the contour. The periprostatic fatty tissue is not. The muscle is away and shouldn't be included. And the rectum, there should be a distinction between prostate and rectum. And that's also the anatomy. There might be a case that uh, you have some extra prostatic extension towards the rectum. What we usually do in practice before starting to treat the patients with either brachytherapy or external beam, we're sending them for a colonoscopy and a rectoscopy, just to make sure that there is no extension that is visible 
uh, in those patients? What would be the case if you don't and you just irradiate with a dose in that part? You might create a fistula, a connection between two hollow organs. In this case, it would be uh, the prostate or the bladder and rectum. Coming down again, you see that the peripheral zone can be clearly depicted, transitional zone as well. The fibromuscular stroma is actually the tip there. If I would have to recontour the whole thing, I would have extended it a bit there, but it's not, uh, it's also due to the interpolation that has been uh, done. Coming down, uh, the urethra is still uh, in the middle. It's easily seen in this case because we have a urethral catheter. In the MRI, it's usually easier to see anyway. Coming down, we have the so-called butterfly shape. And it's not a butterfly per se, but you see that the urethra is there spare. And if I would have done it again, this part is still considered prostate. So the end of the prostate will be here. And that's the part that still needs to be contoured. That as well. Do you understand what I'm saying? Or do you, are you able to visualize what I'm saying? So I, I ended my apical part of the prostate two slides quicker than I should have. And that's uh, something that you need to take into account, especially if you have a patient who has an apical lesion. It needs to be included for sure. And what we usually do with the urethra, we contour it four millimeters below the apical part of the prostate. That's the easy case with an MRI. I think you all got a feeling of what you're supposed to do. And that is actually the case that we're dealing with. Are there any questions regarding MRI contouring? I will use a saying that the Germans are having. There are no silly questions, only silly answers. So you can just take your chance and I will answer appropriately probably. If you don't have any questions regarding the MRI case, we can go to the ultrasound based uh, case. Yeah. Is the, is the other, uh, yeah. So regarding the ultrasound case, um, it's a transrectal ultrasound image from the so-called pre-plan. So it's without the needles being inserted in the prostate. Once we have the metal or plastic needles, depending on availability and uh, custom, then the thing can get a bit tricky you're not being able to visualize due to the artifacts a lot of the um 
structures, especially the prostate. And uh, so once again, we're contouring the same structures. This time is actually, as far as the rectum is concerned, is the anterior uh, rectal wall. In this case, you will be seeing the so-called de Novelier's fascia. Uh, bladder is being contoured the same way. Again, you see the balloon uh, being placed in the prostate. As we go down towards the base, here it's clearly visible the so called de Novelier's. I, I will try and remove everything. You see this whitish line, which is actually between, in this case, the seminal vesicles and the rectum. The mucosa, you need to imagine that is somewhere there. And that's the rectum, the uh, adventitia. And there you have this fascia com uh, combined and consisting of fibrous and fatty tissue. We're contouring that fascia. Coming down, these are the seminal vesicles. The urethra, in this case, is depicted as red. And you see that the prostate is slowly uh, contoured. Again, then the interpolation is not fully 100% allowing us to see the contour. But the aim is to see, especially in these cases, the prostatic capsule which is the one that we need to contour during uh, brachytherapy. And that's what has been contoured in this case. And as we go down towards uh, these intersections shouldn't be seen uh, when you're contouring. So the one organ, especially here where we have the rectoprostatic fascia, you shouldn't have the one organ entering the other. That's a problem of the interpolation and the interpolated case. So we're going towards the apex. These uh, two artifacts, let's say, are the anchor needles, which are being used when we're treating transrectal ultrasound-based uh, prostate brachytherapy. We're trying in a way to fix the prostate and not allow for movements once we're entering and we're implanting the catheters because that's going to shift and change the shape. So in this uh, way, we're trying to uh, visualize and define the prostate. And as you saw, in comparison to the MRI images, we have a difficulty and it's a matter of experience and a matter of seeing a lot and trying to uh, contour um, as, as best as you can. The urethra is once again seen due to the urethral catheter. Unfortunately, this patient, once we were uh, acquiring the images, didn't have the endogel that I told you at the beginning, which we create foam with it, and we can visualize the um, prostatic urethra better than that. So what you actually understood from the whole thing is that the MRI is incomparable in uh, visibility. Ultrasound is the second best, let's say, as far as brachytherapy is concerned well treated and uh, if it's practiced properly, I believe that ultrasound based brachytherapy can be done without any other modality. You have to be careful regarding apex mainly. And if you contour the so-called uh, de Novelliers or uh, vesico uh, rectal and prostatic rectal, fascia, you don't need to worry about any harm to the rectum. So these are the two cases that we were supposed to discuss together. 
and uh, you can try and contour, then I'll pass through you and see what you did and if you have any questions.